So I would like to start with my own land acknowledgement. I'm joining from Amiskwichiwa Sky again. So you guys probably know this as Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory. This is a traditional gathering place, traveling route, um, and meeting place for many peoples, including the Cree, the Suto, the Blackfoot, Métis, Diné, and the Nakota Sioux. Since we're joining on a virtual platform, I'd also like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of all of the traditional territories that you are all joining from across Turtle Island. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the ancestral and unceded territories of all Inuit, Métis, and First Nations people that call this land home. Now, we do these land acknowledgements to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. September 30th is an opportunity for every Canadian to do more for reconciliation. We can take this opportunity to move beyond performative actions like just wearing an orange shirt and learning how to actually practice reconciliation in our everyday lives. So I really hope that today's discussion will bring about further action in our communities, our places of worship, our workplaces, our schools, and of course, our governments. Um, we have to remain committed to this ongoing work of establishing and maintaining respectful relationships to better the lives of everyone who shares this land. So thank you again, everyone for joining us. Um, I hope that these words kind of spark some ideas uh, in your brain so that we can have some good deep conversations on reconciliation. So just to give everybody an idea of what this is gonna look like today, this is what our agenda is gonna be. So um, this first section, I am going to be uh, calling on each of our representative schools to introduce themselves, let us know where they're joining from and take the opportunity to provide their own land acknowledgement. Um, once we're finished welcoming all of our schools, I am going to call on our senators one at a time to introduce themselves and share their first introductory statements about what Truth and Reconciliation Day means to them. Um, once the senators have shared their ideas, we are going to once again go through each of our schools to ask their questions to the senators. Now we did extend this session to an hour and a half, so we will hopefully have a chance to ask two or three questions of the senators, but um, just be prepared that we might not have a chance to get to everybody for three full questions. And there is a chance that some of your questions might be covered by some of the other schools. So if I call on you and you don't have a question or you have an extra question, let me know in the chat and we can try to work from there because it's a round table. So if there is something that comes up and it's really a burning question that you guys need to get covered, that is what the chat is here for. So I am joined with my partner, Sarah at CGE and she is gonna be helping out running the chat, making sure that we don't miss anything. So just keep that in mind, guys. That is a great opportunity to get our attention if you need to during uh, this process. So I would like to begin by calling on Ecole Father Jean in Treaty 6 territory. If you would unmute and give us your welcome statements, please. One second. It's good, Hello. I can hear you, so we're on the right track. Yeah, uh, we are all here in Ecole Father Fa Fa John in St. Albert, Alberta. Wonderful. Okay, and uh, one of our students will be um, reading the land acknowledgement. Awesome, go ahead. Okay, Simone. Good. Oh, let me show you uh, the class first. Hello. I call Father Jan. Uh, I will now. I call Father Jan that it, that it is meeting on the original lands of the Crees, those of Treaty 6, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past. We dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with Indigenous communities in the spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Nicole Father Jean. Thank you for sharing those words. Um, thank you also for joining us also from Treaty 6. Up next, I would like to call on the Isabel Salon School in Alberta Treaty 7 territory.
Hi, this is uh, Isabel Sellen School from uh, Blairmore, or otherwise known as the Crow's Nest Pass in southeastern Alberta. This is Berkeley Fulcard, one of our grade five students here at ISS. Um, and Berkeley's going to do land acknowledgement for Treaty 7. We acknowledge Treaty 7 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Blackfoot Confederacy. Kainai, Kani, and Siksika, as well as the Sioux, Tina Nation, and Stony Dakota First Nation. We acknowledge that this territory is home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3 within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. We acknowledge the many Indigenous peoples who have lived in and cared for these lands for generations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and those and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We make this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and, and gratitude to those whose territory we, we reside on or are visiting. Wonderful. Thank you very much for sharing. Up next, we have Nicole Muriel Martin. And I know we do have a couple classes joining, so I think one of you had agreed to go ahead and do the land acknowledgement. We acknowledge Treaty, treaty 6 territory, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Cree, Tene, Blackfoot, Toto, Nakota, Sioux, as well as the Métis. We recognize on the nombreux membres des peuples des Premières Nations Métis et Inuit dont les pas foulant ces terres depuis des générations. We are grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We recognize, recognize ces terres en guise d'acte de réconciliation et pour ex exprimer notre gratitude envers ceux dans les ter le territoire et l'endroit où nous résidons ou que nous visitons. Merci. Thank you. Thank you, merci. That was beautiful and it's wonderful to include uh, some French in there as well. I love that. Okay, up next we have Dakota Collegiate from Manitoba. We are the first people of the ancient land of Turtle Island. Our place of learning is located on the ancestral land of the Ojibwe, Cree, Oji Cree, Anishinaabe, Inuak, Dene, Anishinaabe, Red River Métis, and Dakota people. Our ancestors' footsteps mark these lands just as ours do. We respect the treaties made on this land and acknowledge the harms, mistakes, and inter intergenerational trauma that continues to resonate in our communities today. We recognize ourselves as Indigenous students working together in a spirit of reconciliation and cooperation in the ongoing relationships between nations and on Turtle Islands. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay, up next we have De La Salle Co uh, College in Ontario. Hi everyone, we are De La Salle College. We're on Treaty 13, the land covered by the Toronto Purchase. For a grade eight class, and I'm going to pass off to Olivia, who's going to be doing our land acknowledgement today. We, as a class community, and on behalf of Del Sol College of Oakland, acknowledge that we are gathering on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Mississauga of the Cred First Nation, the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, Wenda, and Metis people. We thank these groups for nurturing this land for time immemorial and we recognize Canada's colonized past that led them to sharing it. Moreover, we appreciate the privilege we have that allows us to live and learn in these areas. We commit to reconciliation and promise to work so that the space we take up is truthful and inclusive. Awesome, thank you very much, De La Salle. And finally, we have Northeast King's Education Center in Nova Scotia. You're going to talk into that. Okay. Yeah. I'm a settler living in Mi'kma'ki, the unsurrendered lands of the Mi'kmaq Nation. Mi'kma'ki is governed by the treaties and peace of peace and friendship, an agreement made between the British Crown and the Mi'kmaq Nation beginning in 1726, and it still stands today. The treaty stated that the Mi'kmaq Nation would remain sovereign and lay out the terms of a peaceful relationship between nations. 
The Crown governments have not honored those terms, and we, as people who live in Mi'kma'ki, want to recognize that injustice and our responsibilities to do better. As settlers, we must treat this land and its creatures with care and respect. This is not just our home, it's all of our homes. Beautiful, such strong words. Thank you very much. And thank you again to all of our students who prepared those words. Um, they were wonderful to hear, and I think they were like a very great introduction to what we're going to be discussing today. Um, I did just get a note that um, one of our senators is going to be a few minutes late. So we are actually going to skip ahead and I'm actually going to begin with Senator Pat Duncan. So Senator Duncan, if you would like to share with us um, a short little introduction statement that you've prepared um, on the topic of truth and uh, reconciliation. And also, good morning and welcome. <laughs> Senator, you're on mute is um, <laughs> the most famous words of 2021 and 2020 to 2022. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for um, asking me to be part of uh, a panel today. I'm truly honored and appreciate the um, land acknowledgements that have been offered. Most often, I would be speaking to the Senate during hybrid times from the traditional territory of the Tan Kwachin Council and the Kwan Dun First Nation. Today, I'm grateful to be speaking to you from the traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. And my lived experience in the Yukon is very different from elsewhere in Canada. And in my lifetime, we have truly become treaty people in the Yukon. And if I might continue with a few more words about um, the situation in the Yukon. I see the, the uh, chair, Rebecca's nodding at me. So I'll just share with you briefly. Um, it, you might be familiar, students, with your Canadian history and the gold rush in the Yukon in 1898. And Dawson City at that time was uh, the largest city west of, Dawson City in the Yukon was the largest city west of Chicago and north of San Francisco. That was in 1898. In 1902, Chief Jim Boss of the Tan Kwachin Council petitioned the Commissioner of the Yukon for a reserve. An offer of land was made. There was no treaty ever signed. Reserves were not created in the Yukon. There was lands set aside. The long before the Truth and Reconciliation um, Commission was established, Elijah Smith a First Nation elder and several other First Nation leaders presented a document called Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow to then Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. It was the first time that a group of Canadian people of Indigenous ancestry had prepared and presented such a document to the Government of Canada. The document was based on the principles that all Indians of the Yukon, and I must say that that was, is a quote, that is why I'm using the word, um, the term Indians. That's how First Nations, as we most often describe them in the Yukon, were described back then. That document in, stated that Indians had the right to develop their lives fully in a society where their cultural and social wishes and needs were capable of being met. The document outlines Aboriginal rights, defines what it means to be an Indian, and claims the traditional homeland, the Yukon. The language has changed over time. The point was that Prime Minister accepted that document, and after years of negotiations, an umbrella final agreement was signed between Canada, the Yukon, and the Council of Yukon Indians, now named the Council of Yukon First Nations. The Grand Chief is Peter Johnson, who is the son of Sam Johnson, who was one of the presenters of the document Together Today for Our Children Tomorrow. He was also served as the Speaker of the Yukon Legislative Assembly. Under that umbrella final agreement, 11 of 14 Yukon First Nations have now completed their negotiations and they have a final land claim agreement. And those land claim agreements address all manner of issues that are in your questions that I saw today, as well as um, such items as a development, pre development assessment process, the, an environmental assessment process. These are modern day treaties and giving life and meaning to these treaties have enabled governments to establish what we term a government-to-government-to-government -to -government -to -government relationship, 
which means that Canada, Yukon First Nations with a signed final agreement, 11, 14 of them, and the Yukon government work together for the betterment of people. And it, this in is best described by um, our regional chief, Kluwani Adamak, who is the regional chief for the Yukon to the Assembly of First Nations. And she describes this situation in the Yukon as a Yukon that leads. And if you would like to study this further, I would highly recommend there's some academic articles that have been published. And by Gabriel Slowey, I can send this information. Uh, I'll ask that my staff will send this information to um, Cengage to be passed on. But the article I'm referring to is, is entitled Indigenous Self-Government in the Yukon, Looking for Ways to Pass the Torch. And it's found on the Institute for Research for Public Policies website. I'd also highly recommend to all students a visit to the Council of Yukon First Nations website, which um, will lead you in turn to some of the, the other Yukon First Nation um, websites. And they will share with you some of the things that um, we're working on, as well as the land claim agreements for further study. So I'm, I, once again, thank you. Merci, Megwitch. Um, Masi Cho, as we use in the uh, Yukon um, one of the Yukon First Nation languages. I'm delighted to be here with you today and I look forward to any of your questions. Thank you so much. Wonderful, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts. Um, Senator Duncan, coming from an area outside of the traditional treaty lands, I think it is great that you have such um, a specific perspective on these ideas coming from the territories. So um, we really appreciate you joining us again to participate this year. Thank you very much. Um, all right, up next, I would like to call on Senator Klein to share his opening remarks with us as well. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking from Ottawa on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory. I'm from Saskatchewan, Treaty 4 territory and homeland of the Métis Nation. And I am a member of Little Black Bears Band. Thank you for inviting me and for the opportunity to share my perspective on reconciliation and the TRC's calls to action. I'll speak briefly about those topics and I look forward to hearing your questions. Let's begin with reconciliation. This is a word that you've likely heard many times. You may have heard it on the news, come across it in your studies, or perhaps you've mentioned it in conversations with your friends and family. It's an important word, one that speaks of reconciling Canada's relationship with indigenous peoples. That's important and it's a good place to start. We need to understand indigenous history if we want to make a better future. But I think that reconciliation needs to be more than just a word. It must speak to something greater, like the restoration of relationships and making amends between peoples based on the truth of Canadian history, including the atrocity of res residential schools. For me, reconciliation in this context is about taking a step back and discovering how we got here and acknowledging the wrongdoings and the mistreatment of Indigenous peoples. That would mean understanding our history and the impact of colonization, which began in the 16th century. This would be a good place to start and would build trust and show integrity. From there, we should think about making amends and importantly, treating Indigenous people as you want to be treated. Respect inherent treaty rights, ceremony, language and culture. As students, you've taken the first step. Having those difficult conversations and acknowledging our country's past is important, but we have an opportunity to go beyond the conversation. I encourage you to think about what you can do to make the leap from simply talking about reconciliation to living it. On Friday, the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, this is an opportunity to reflect. The TRC's 94 calls to action are inextricably linked to reconciliation. They are asking us as a country, as friends, as people to make changes. So if you take away just one thing from what I have to say, it's that whenever you hear the word reconciliation, I hope you'll think of how you can make a difference. Let's not talk about the TRC calls to action. As a senator, I focus on fulfilling our core role in Canadians in Canada's constitution. That is to provide sober second thought, examining bills that come to us 
from the House of Commons. That means we have the an opportunity to use our position to advance reconciliation through legislation. In recent years, the Senate has played a significant role in answering the TRC calls to action by passing relevant bills. Let me give you some examples. In 2019, we passed Bill C-91, a bill that is helping to revitalize Indigenous languages. It was sponsored by my friend and mentor, the Honorable Murray Sinclair, Chair of the TRC. We passed Bill C-92 to restore Indigenous jurisdiction over child and family services, a bill that was sponsored by Senator Patty Lubbockane Benson, a Métis Senator from Alberta. This was bill, bill was important to help undo the legacy of residential schools and make it easier for Indigenous families to stay together. And we passed the most historic bill for reconciliation in Canadian history, the Sill 15, Bill C-15-15, which recognizes Indigenous peoples' inherent rights to self-determination in Canadian law. Known as UNDRIP, the law now requires a UN declaration on the rights of Indigenous peoples to be implemented. The Senate has also played a role around calls to action yet to be answered. For example, Senator Kuchar from Nova Scotia has sponsored Bill S-251 to repeal Section 43 of the Criminal Code, Criminal Code, which allows corporal punishment on kids. One other straightforward call to action to answer is number 79, which calls upon the federal government to collaborate with Indigenous representation and the arts community to develop a reconciliation framework for Canadian heritage and commemoration. I'm pleased to share with you that in June of 20, 2022, my province, Saskatchewan, answered call to action 82, dedicating the Saskatchewan Residential School Memorial on the grounds of Government House in Regina. The TRC's calls to action can have a real and important impact on the lives of Indigenous peoples. By answering those calls, we make Canada a better place. There's still a lot of work ahead. Like I said at the beginning of my, re my remarks, reconciliation is more than just a conversation. It's about action, taking steps to begin a journey. Thank you for listening. Mr. Goodall, back to you. Thank you, merci, and hi, kita tamahim. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, I do really appreciate you giving these students specific examples of what the Senate is doing in recalls to those uh, 94 calls to action, because I do think that really is the whole purpose um, of bringing these schools together with the Senate to see, you know, what actual action can happen and to let them know that having these questions and having these discussions can lead to real change in our country. So thank you very much for sharing those with us. Um, so unfortunately, um, Senator Pate is still, I guess, running behind a few minutes. So I think when she's able to join us, we'll go ahead and give her her time uh, to share her introduction statement. Um, but while we are waiting for her to join, we will go ahead and get started with our questions. So I did just put in the chat the order um, of our first round of questions. So we are going to go in the order that you guys did your land acknowledgements. So we're going to begin by calling on Ecole Father Jean to ask their first question to the senators. Um, and senators, it would be great. We do have some time. So it would be great if you both would like to share your response to these. You are more than welcome to. Um, We'll kind of see where we get to with um, our discussions as we go, but I do want to try to give you guys both time to speak on each of them if we can. Okay, sorry, go ahead, Nicole Father Jean. I cannot hear you. Is it just me? Uh, can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. Um, I have Jaws, we have one question here. Uh, since it's been taking so long to give to indigenous people full access to the residential school file, and you know they need to know more about what happened to some of their members who are still missing today. So our question is, what can you as a senator, what, what can you do uh, to speed up the process to help them um, get access to those files. And I just wanna make sure that uh, the audio came through clear. So I think they're asking uh, access to files uh, from the residential schools. Correct. Okay, yeah. So um, 
Senator Klein or Senator Duncan, did either of you want to take this one first? Just for clarity, help them provide or get help them to get access to the residential school files? Yes, help them like uh, to have access as quick as possible because because it's been taking so long for them. Oh, but, uh, okay, it's not you that's seeking access. You're wondering how Indigenous peoples can get access. Correct. Okay. Well, I'll I'll uh, I'll just start, but I know I'm sure uh, Senator Duncan will have a, a a much more fuller and richer answer than I'm going to give you. But uh, th th there's one route that I would look at is, is in terms of a senator. For a resource to to look to, during the uh, Senate, we do have a uh, on our agenda. It's called question period, whereby I could ask the leader of government uh, in the Senate to advise or inform us about where the what the status is of the access to residential school records, and what this government is doing about that to ensure that there is that access accessibility. Now, the leader of government uh, may have an answer to that. If not, they will look into it and they will come back to the Senate and, and provide an answer. So with that, over to Senator Duncan. Senator, Senator Klein, you gave exactly the same answer I was going to give. Um, I would just add to that, um, that in terms of the... Um, searches and some of the other research. Um, the territory, the U I'm from the Yukon and the Yukon government has indicated that they're not going to wait for the federal government to provide assistance to First Nations to do um, searches at um, the residential schools and have contributed as well. So um, I totally agree as um, with Senator Klein that our route as senators is to ask a question in question period. Um, as individuals giving support, um, you can also ask your MP to ask the same question in question periods, and you can ask your MLA or MHA, um, depending on what part of Canada you're from, to also ask how is, there, how is the provincial government also pushing this issue? At the risk of being political, that is uh, <laughs> suggestions that I might make. Thank you. And I see Senator Pate is here. Yes, I would like to say, so thank you both um, to an uh, for answering that question. I, um, I would like to call on Senator Pate. Um, I'm sorry to put you on the spot after you've just hopped into our meeting, um, but I would like to give you the opportunity to share a brief introductory statement if you'd like. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, I need to apologize to all of you and to my colleagues for being late. Uh, it's no excuse. I was in the midst of another meeting and suddenly I started getting a bunch of messages saying, where are you? You're not in where you're supposed to be. So my apologies uh, for that. I join you from the shores of the Kitchissippi, the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabek, on whose territory I have the privilege and responsibility to live and work. And I don't want to delay the discussion any further. I would be happy to join into the conversation. I think the, uh, the fact that you have chosen to talk about the importance of reconciliation this week as we're um, celebrating the second, or observing, I should say, the second um, National Day of Reconciliation is vitally important and I look forward to contributing whatever I'm able to. So thank you very much. And thank you especially to Senator Duncan and Senator Klein for uh, being on time and participating and while, well, and I will do my very best to catch up. Wonderful, thank, thank you, you very here. much. I'm running out of jokes. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting so dry in here. Thank goodness you joined. <laughs> Um, yeah, so just to speak quickly on that question before we move on to uh, Isabel Salon, um, I would like to say I do like that call to action that um, our senators shared um, to the students participating, right? It, you're never too young to get involved in politics, as Senator Duncan said, the risk of getting political. So yes, write to your MPs and try to get involved. That's the best way to get these actions completed. Um, is there any other thoughts that we would like to share on this uh, question before we move on to uh, Isabel Salon? Good. All right. I will call on Isabel Salon School to go ahead and ask their question, please. Uh, 
Hi, once again, from the Crow's Nest Pass, this is Izzy Long, and she is going to ask our first question. Mental health in our youth is in crisis right now. How will sensitivities increase the much-needed support for Indigenous youth in Canada? So I think, sorry, the question was, how are we increasing support for Indigenous youth in Canada? Mental health support. Oh, mental health supports for Indigenous youth. All right, so do we have a senator that would like to go first for this one? All right, Senator Pate, I will pass it over to you. I think that's an excellent question. As I'm reminded by so many young people uh, on a daily basis, especially during this pandemic, the impact particularly on young people who have missed out on years of education and socializing and all of the things that we expect young people to do in their developing years is going to be really important going forth. And so I think uh, there's work being done certainly in uh, the mental health area, but to not link it to, for particularly when we're talking about reconciliation, to uh, sovereignty and economic uh, as well as social well-being is really important. And I was reminded of this last night. I was meeting with some uh, parliamentarians from New Zealand, uh, including some Maori uh, parliamentarians. And you may know that their prime minister actually was one of the first out of the gate to say, when we're looking at coming out of this pandemic, we need to talk about not just recovery for all as words, but how do we actually measure recovery in some other way than just gross domestic product or economics that we actually have to look at how people come out uh, together. And so I wish I had a really clear answer for how we're going to do that. The government has certainly made commitments. Many communities have made commitments. And it struck me uh, coming out of the hor horrific, horrific uh, tragedies and travesties in the James Smith Cree Nation, that the leadership, indigenous leadership was calling for exactly this, resources and sovereignty to make decisions in community, to resource community, to make sure young people um, for not just now and dealing with the aftermath, but going forward, have the supports to actually uh, not only you know, survive, but thrive. And so uh, I thank you for raising that and reminding us that's part of what we're supposed to be doing in the Senate, um, as I'm sure you've already heard, Part of our role is to represent the interests of those who don't get represented by elected officials, oftentimes because they're issues that take longer to work on than the electoral cycle, the, the couple or four years. And so um, all of us here and our colleagues that aren't here speaking to you take very seriously our responsibility to represent the interests of what are often referred to as minority issues or issues of people who don't get represented. And I see youth as part of that, mental health as part of that. And as some of you know, may know for years, I worked with young people, men and women who are most on the margins, whether it's because they're poor, racialized, have different ability, uh, whether it's their identities, and, um, and also who end up in institutions, whether it's residential school or the aftermath of that of child welfare and into the prison system. So really, really important question and vital that we work on it um, from the, the roots, not just you know, parachuting in when there are crises. Yeah, and I think Senator Duncan, you had some thoughts to add? If I might, um, and thank you, Senator Pate has outlined um, institutionally what we what we do. Um, I'd also like to, uh, I think the, the specific question was what can we, the Senate, do? One of the things that um, I do along with Senator Pate is sit on the National Finance Committee and we review all of the money that's proposed to be spent by government. And because we're the Senate and um, we have a little more time at times than than the um, House of Commons, we will spend upwards of seven, eight, 10, 12 hours talking to witnesses and asking them questions, whereas the House of Commons doesn't spend as much time um, always in looking at every single line item that the government spends. We often will ask um, the Department of um, Indigenous Services, the Department of Health, 
and we'll call them as witnesses. And we ask questions of what resources are you putting towards um, mental health and mental health supports for young people. So that's something we, the Senate, can do. We can't change that number and we can't tell the government, no, they can't spend the money, but we can certainly ask the tough questions. And thank you so much for your question. Um, I think it will be certainly come up in our National Finance Committee meetings in the future. So thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Any other ideas that we would like to share on this topic before we move to our next question? Senator Klein? Uh, just one comment I'll make. Uh, like education, health is uh, in the jurisdiction of the provinces. At the same time, the federal government does provide some oversight of the well-being and welfare of Indigenous peoples, particularly treaty people. And uh, they also make it, they're also mindful of uh, the true de definition of ind Indigenous or the Aboriginal Constitution definition, which is First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And so they will, uh, while the jurisdiction for health resides with the provinces, uh, if the provinces require additional resources to ensure that uh, Indigenous peoples have access to uh, the health care, including mental health care, uh, that they would, they can call upon and they will call upon the feds and the federal governments will probably try to negotiate some position on that to ensure that there is access. And I think that uh, it's fair to say that in some jurisdictions, there has been some racialized treatment of Indigenous peoples, and uh, we all need to address that and make sure that those barriers are taken down as well. And there should be no discrimination against anyone getting access to mental health or any type of health care or for any reason in, in this uh, country. Thank you. Very true. And I, I do think that uh, Isabel Salon kind of touched on a, a much larger issue than we're able to tackle in one small question. So thank you for uh, bringing that issue to our attention. I would like to call on next uh, Nicole Miro Martin. I see you guys are ready for your questions. You can go ahead. When or how will we know that these calls to action have been accomplished and successful? Furthermore, our generation was born into this situation, so we're wondering how Indigenous children our age feel about this initiative. That's a very interesting question. So uh, when and how do we get reporting on these calls to action, and how do we know how Indigenous youth feel about the TRC's calls to action? Senator Klein, I'll call on you first. Yeah, I'll just give you a quick answer on that and set the table for my colleagues, but the, you know, we'll know we've arrived and the calls to action have been answered when there are no disparities, there are uh, equal treatment amongst peoples, uh, equal opportunities, the right to participate, the right to know, uh, the right to have uh, participating in, in decisions that impact the, uh, the lands and the territories and the rights of Indigenous peoples. And you know some of the telltale signs will be a representative workforce. If in a community there's uh, you know ten percent of indigenous people represent the community, they should probably be at least ten percent of of the workforce and uh, ten percent of the top paid salaries and ten percent of the uh, composition of, of board of directors and so on and so forth. And everybody has that equal right to participate in an economy. So you'll see. Uh, the acceleration of a higher participation rate in jobs and business ownership uh, uh, in uh, uh, some of the professional uh, occupations of education, of, of uh, health, of welfare. And you would just see a melding of, of this and there would be no uh, disparities or discriminations of participation and knowledge. So I'll, I'll just throw that over to my colleagues now. Thank you. Hey, Senator Duncan, I'll pass it to you next. Thank you very much. Um, I think we might recognize um, that we've made progress when the rest of the country catches up to the Yukon in some of our initiatives. And by that, I mean, as I referenced before, our government to government to government relationships. 
with for, with the Yukon First Nations. And to build upon the examples that were set um, outlined, the table that was set by Senator Klein, let me refer you to um, the Vuntik Gwich'in First Nation in Old Crow. Old Crow is the only fly-in community in the Yukon. It's the most northern community in all of the Yukon. And um, in terms of just one, two small items, they're not small, in terms of two issues, the Vuntik Gwich'in was the first government in um, of many to declare a climate emergency in recognition of the climate change that they're seeing in the community. And to deal with that, um, the Vuntik Gwich'in First Nation have taken, have built a solar farm to power their community. Previously, the um, power to the community was supplied by diesel generators and the diesel fuel was flown into the community. They have built a solar farm that is owned and, um, and operated by the First Nation. And they have successfully removed um, the use of thousands, hundreds of thousands of gallons of diesel fuel every year. Vuntuk Wichin, in terms of their business development, also are 49% owners of the Yukon's airline, Air North, which offers daily service, Boeing 737 jet service between Vancouver and Whitehorse and um, Edmonton and Whitehorse. It's in direct competition to Air Canada. And it's a very, very successful Yukon owned, indigenous half owned airline. So that's when we see the rest of the country with these sorts of tremendous success stories and working in that government to government relationship alongside one another and serving their community, I think we'll see many of the calls to truth and um, many of the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, realized. And thank you. I'm um, very proud of the Yukon and, and the progress we've made. So thank you for listening to me. Senator Pate. Yeah, I I, um, I think the responses of both my colleagues are excellent. I and I don't mean to sound like I'm dodging the question, but I'm not sure how we'll know uh, because I suspect there will be evolving issues that we can't even imagine now. That when the TRC was looking at the issues. Um, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples before them didn't envision. And when the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry started looking at issues, they uncovered even more that the TRC didn't look at. And so I don't mean to be vague or, uh, you know, but I, I do think you will know. And um, so will individuals who experience the, the least. And I think that's a bit of what both my colleagues are getting at, that uh, for as long as people don't have access to housing, clean water, education, uh, economic supports, we haven't achieved it, that's for sure. And so we need to keep pushing in those directions and understand that we can't keep abandoning people to the only systems that can't refuse them. And what I mean by that is, if you look at what the missing and murdered, it, TRC as well, but also the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, inquiry looked at, they found that the very same issues that give rise to Indigenous women being more likely to be disappeared, murdered, homeless on the streets uh, are the same issues that give rise to them being imprisoned, even though they're mostly jailed for things that don't necessarily cause a risk to public safety. And yet we don't have the same access to supports. And when I left Alberta, um, 30 years ago now, this, this past year, uh, the, at that time, 90% of young men who were Indigenous who had reached the age of majority had criminal records, and yet they didn't have access to post-secondary education. And so those are some of the measures that I think that we can look to and say, okay, so there's individual discrimination, but then there's systemic issues that we need to look at. And so there are many, many reports. I look forward to a time when we're not having reports that we're instead celebrating the incredible progress of 
um, indigenous young people, indigenous leaders, um, and indigenous leadership on all of these issues as my colleagues have already identified. Go ahead, Senator Klein. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Senator Pate raises a couple of very good points there. There, like it is a long road we need to travel here. And some of that uh, framework has been set out, yet we haven't necessarily followed what wisdom was in there. And one of them is that Senator Paint mentioned was the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. That was a very in-depth study and it'd be a good one for students to, uh, if they wanted to pick it up on their, on their own and, and uh, have a look into that Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which is, the acronym for that is RCAP. Uh, you would find a lot of good advice and direction that was provided in there. And unfortunately we didn't uh, follow through on all those, all the uh, actions that were outlined in the, uh, in that framework of the RCAP. The other thing was the uh, Kelowna Accord, which was very close to becoming a reality of something that would be followed. It's called the Kelowna Accord because the agreement was signed in Kelowna. Uh, that was chock full of other good uh, actions and practices that could be embraced and followed. And we could close that gap. And what uh, Senator Pate was talking about is taking steps to close the gaps. And, uh, and sometimes, you know what, baby steps get you there sooner than none at all. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we actually do have two classes joining us from Muriel Martin. So I am just going to call on before we go to Dakota College. I'm going to call on Muriel Martin to ask us their second question as well. Okay. What is provided through Jordan's principle to help First Nations kids? Hey, do we have a senator that would like to speak on Jordan's principle and how it's helping Indigenous youth? Thank you, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, a woman I know whose son is autistic and I spoke about um, him in the, uh, her and him in the Senate uh, not long ago. And she had been applying uh, for Jordan's principal to have some support. And what, what had hampered her was a perception that she needed to um, be doing more than she could do as a single mom trying to hold down a job and go to school. And so uh, what Jordan's principle is supposed to do is make accessible to Indigenous young people uh, the same issues that are supposed to be accessible to non-Indigenous young people, and in particular, uh, have not been made available on reserves. In this case, she lived in, uh, in an urban community in Saskatchewan, and she was being denied really what amounted to um, uh, someone's judgment about whether she deserved to have support and assistance. And interestingly enough, it only took a pending or ad adding to her application. Uh, the, the statement I made, which was her statement, I, I paid her a, a contract to help me understand these issues. And that statement um, was part of what helped her get access. That's exactly the sort of issue why Cindy Blackstock continues to push the government. The government has made some huge positive steps, but they've been dragged there kicking and screaming by the First Nations Caring Society in a context where so many of us, um, my colleagues and others have been involved in issues where um, sometimes we don't even get the baby, step, the baby steps that Senator Klein uh, suggested. And in part it's because the people most impacted by inequalities too often are people who don't have resources to hire lawyers, to argue it out in court. And so we, you probably, I probably would not have even known about Jordan, while well, it was created by um, Cindy and her team created the idea and called it Jordan's Principle, which is basically that you shouldn't have inequality in this country. The Charter of Rights and Freedom says it already, but to breathe life into it, you need sometimes people to take the action on and challenge. And so they talked about it as Jordan's principle because as many, I, think, I suspect you all know, uh, Jordan didn't get access to that. His family could not afford uh, what he needed to be home. So he lived and he was born, lived and died in a hospital. 
And so they call it Jordan's principle to say, you know, no other child should have to experience this. The government signed on and agreed to honor uh, Jordan's principle. And yet we've seen them again through the work of Cindy Blackstock and First Nations Caring Society that they did so for certain groups, but had still left some out. And so there's an incremental, very good, big, not just a baby step, but a big step forward. But there's also now the continued need to push to make sure it's achieved for um, for everybody, not just for those who um, who had access. So uh, I know that um, there'll be lots of other examples that my colleagues can provide too. Yeah, do either of our other participating senators want to speak more on um, what Jordan's principle does or what it uh, supports it could potentially provide for youth? I think that was a great answer. I can't add to that. <laughs> it was we're good. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Senator Pate, for such an in-depth answer on that one. Um, I would like to call next on Dakota Collegiate to go ahead and ask their question. Nice and close. Get nice and close. The cost of food in a northern Indigenous community is outrageous. What kind of work or conversations do you do around this? I do think that one was very clear. She got very close to the microphone. Does anybody have any ideas about the cost of food in the north? Uh, Senator Pate, I'll call on you first. Well, actually, I'm not a northern senator, and I just saw Senator Duncan put up her hand. So let's go to Senator Duncan first. There are two answers. Um, one is um, the access to food and food security is the is the issue. In part, it, it's a it has to be affordable and it's got to be accessible. Um, one of the unintended consequences and side benefits of um, climate change has been the increase in agriculture in the Yukon where I'm from. And um, that's something serving on the agriculture committee now. I'm able to draw other senators to the draw it to their attention. There's always been a an agricultural community, but it's it's become increasingly um, prevalent in the north. For example, we now have locally Yukon produced eggs um, and milk, as well as the grain and root crops. Um, what the government of Canada um, has done in terms of support is um, there's a northern food security program where they enable the they supplement the cost. And frequently, the Northern MPs have insisted upon that amount being raised. It's through the um, through Canada Post and through other delivery programs. So there is money that is is put towards reducing as reducing the cost of food in the North. And um, the other item is support for um, sustainable harvest and ensuring that um, those who harvest our natural resource resources for food supplies have access and that those northern uh, sustainably harvested food sources are protected in any sort of um, review, environmental assessment or um, a review. So those are sort of financially their support, environmentally their support, and um, we're also seeing support uh, in the Yukon and I believe in the other two territories as well, when we're speaking Northern, for um, alternate and new sources for growing our own food. I think that answers your question. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, do we have any thoughts we would like to add to that? I know Senator Duncan has kind of cornered the market on the ideas living in the North, but do we have anything we'd like to add? Senator Pate? Well, the only thing I'd add is, the, you know, for those who aren't aware, and you probably are, um, so if I'm repeating, just someone wave your hands and tell me to be quiet. But um, those are really positive initiatives that are happening. But I was horrified the last time I was in Hollywood that um, to hear from folks who can't access some of those supports yet, or they weren't yet available. Um, just, you know, I went into the grocery store to see the cost. But also to see how those who were really already really privileged, and there was a, a very clear race divide, uh, that it was often people who uh, were 
uh, not indigenous who were had come from the south were working there who had um, different salary better salaries had Amazon Prime had all of these things and were able to order things from the south in a way that many folks living in the north just couldn't and couldn't get access to so paradoxically or you know completely uh, illogically the you had some of the wealthiest people benefiting from those programs, not the people who were really struggling on the ground. And so I think the challenge of really ensuring that that um, those resources get to the people on the ground is really, really important. And I think people like Senator Duncan and the leadership she takes in, in her area and uh, Senator Anderson and others who are, uh, who are, and Patterson who are from the North work really hard to try and make sure uh, we are reminded of that, that we need to be ensuring the resources are available and that we need to probe exactly how the distribution is happening. So thank you for that question. Wonderful. Do we have any last thoughts before we move on to De La Salle College? Okay, then I will call on our friends joining us from De La Salle College. Oh, sorry, Senator Klein, would you well, like to- I was to just gonna say, you know, I share the same view as my colleagues and, uh, and on my trip to Iqaluit, uh, I too was shocked at the, the prices of, of uh, groceries and staples. I was also, uh, it was a real eye-opening as well. Uh, and Senator Duncan touched on not just affordability, but accessibility to get, groceries and other staples into Iqaluit, it's like a six month waiting time. And so hopefully they order the right amount, but also has to have some shelf life to stay uh, fresh and available. And that's sometimes a challenge to get all that product up there. And it only comes up, uh, I shouldn't say only, but quite often it's uh, every six months the ship comes in type thing. So it's they, they quite often run down to lower inventories and it's uh, you got to find the alternative and the substitutes to to fill in that shortage uh, on time really thanks yeah and I think I do think um, a lot of our students are joining from southern cities in areas where they really don't have to think about issues like this so um, for those of us that have never been to the Northern Territories, it is like such a huge issue that you probably don't, your families probably don't even have to think about. So thank you very much for having the perspective to ask that question. We really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to move now to our friends at De La Salle College. You guys can go ahead and ask your question, please. Awesome. Our first question comes from Sebastian between uh, him and Roberto's discussions. So the question is, how will museums properly acknowledge the history of residential school, schools through the perspective of Indigenous youth? In accordance with Point 69 Part 2 of the Pulse of Action document, will these records be shown in Indigenous languages as well as English and French to make them truly accessible to the public? Wonderful. So, um... As far as the Senate goes, do we have any perspective um, of how we deal with that uh, representing Indigenous items and stories and ideas in Indigenous languages with an Indigenous perspective in our museums? Does anybody have thoughts on that that they would like to share? That there are some uh, calls to action that lend themselves to that uh, in respect of particularly residential schools. Uh, and I'll ask you to look up, well, here's a little takeaway or assignment for your homework, but look to calls to action 79 and 82, um, but also the, um, we could lean on more of hearing the stories of survivors. And I, I can't remember where I was recently and in, in there was the discussions around residential schools, so on and so forth. And there was rep representative people there but there was not enough survivors. Uh, and there are two types of survivors. One, those that actually did survive residential school. And there's a, a, a veteran from Saskatchewan who's 90 some years old and could still remember vividly and has a sharp memory about what happened with him and his, his sister. Uh, there's also 
the other vet, the other uh, uh, survivors are those who survived their siblings or their children and never to see their siblings or children again. And they survived that and live with it. And so our heart goes out to them that they have to uh, endure that as a survivor. Let, and it's so it's, the survivor is one that went to residential school, made it through that, survived that process. And then there were those that have to live with that. They survive it. They may not have been there. That's typically older siblings or uh, parents and grandparents, communities. Thank you. Hey, Senator Duncan or Pate, do you have any ideas you'd like to add to this one? I could add just uh, I just wanted to build on Senator Klein's um, last point um, when he mentioned um, the cost of food in in uh, Iqaluit and delivery of food. I just want to emphasize for students that um, the three territories, while they're all territories, are like a bowl of fruit. And they are as different as apples, oranges, and bananas. They're all different. And the most important point um, is the importance of infrastructure in the North. What you were hearing in that comment about the food was the importance of infrastructure and building infrastructure to Nunavut so they're not reliant upon the, those twice a year ships. Um, and Northwest Territories has a number of fly-in communities only. And the Yukon is blessed that we are connected by road with every community save one. So it, they're very, very different. The issues are absolutely the same um, in many, many respects, but um, as they are in, in the Northern part of many of the provinces. Um, the focus, how, I just wanted to make that point because we, we tend to get a bit bristly when everyone thinks of the North in one, one lump. Um, in terms of, I think part of your question was recognition and importance of language in um, sharing our culture and sharing our stories. And um, I would just note that um, we have more than 14 um, First Nation languages. We have lost because of the passing of some of our elders, some of our languages, and there has been a concerted effort um, in large part uh, to because of the relationship um, of governments and of the initiative of First Nation governments to, um, for example, sponsor students to learn, to spend their time learning their language so that there are many young people, compared with when I was growing up in the Yukon, there are many young people who, um, who speak Han or, um, or Tlingit, and um, that is their first language. Also, um, the First Nation languages um, are shared in elementary school as you would learn a few words of French, you also learn a few words of Tlingit or or Han or one of the other languages. So the importance of language cannot be understated. And um, and the ability then to share, share stories is so important. Thank you. Wonderful. And I, I can agree more, especially when we have uh, traditions that are based in oral sharings, right? Those languages are so, so important. So um, thank you to Dilisal. It really does sound like Again, this is this is a, an issue that that is bigger than just us making a rule for museums, right? That whole idea of uh, strengthening those languages in those communities. Um, I think that really is where it begins. Um, so we're going to move to our final school to ask their first question, Northeast Kings Education Center. I don't know if your camera is working anymore, but hopefully we can still hear you if you'd like to go ahead and ask your question. Oh, yes, we can still see you. Wonderful. In call to action number eight, the federal government is called to eliminate the funding discrepancy between on and off reserve education. The 2021 federal budget allocated $2.5 billion to before and after school childcare on reserve, but this does not address the drastic underfunding of on reserve schools. Has the federal government invested directly in the teaching curriculum and school infrastructure on reserve? 
Go ahead, Senator Klein. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I would have. I was asking the same question two or three years ago, uh, and uh, I think you did a, a polite ask there. I, I may not have been as uh, polite, uh, but kind of from the points that uh, Senator Pate and and Senator Duncan were making is that where senators have the opportunity to dive into these things and and ask the tough questions. And sometimes we don't even get the the, uh, the answers we're looking for, so we continue to go back and 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 chip away at that. Uh, but I remember th uh, three or so years ago, I was right, quite disappointed, and I used Saskatchewan as a, an example where uh, non-Indigenous students for their education were being funded by the province. And again, I just want to pause there. Education is a responsibility for the jurisdiction of the provinces and territories. That said, the federal government does have some uh, a great responsibility over Indigenous peoples, uh, particularly uh, treaty peoples. And uh, there has been some recent bills, the uh, Daniels versus Canada and, and, and another piece of uh, legislation that Métis people are also included in this and, and non-status. Anyway. Back to the discrepancy between education funding in Saskatchewan. It was something like $4,500 per student to the mainstream of education, but on school, on reserve students, uh, the funding for education was something around $3,200. So there was a, a big gap there. And it's difficult to retain good teachers in these uh, reserve settings when you're not keeping, when you're not competitive with uh, off reserve education and what they're paying uh, teachers there as well. It's tough to upkeep the uh, repair and maintenance and quality of classroom environments when you're also looking at reduced funding. And I, it was last year, and I think uh, when I was still on national finance, uh, we had the uh, it was uh, in, uh, Indigenous Services or the Crown Indigenous Services came in and uh, they were quite excited for me to ask this question yet once again to tell me that how they had closed the gap. And I was I was quite uh, pleasantly surprised and I was happy that they kept their eye on the ball there and through a little bit of time and uh, some good resourcing they were able to close that gap. So that, that's one example I've known where they continue to try to close these gaps. And I'm sure there's more since then. Hey, Senator Pate. Yeah, I think that's a, a great question because we know as Senator, uh, our former Senator Sinclair always said, and it's part of the TRC, education got us into this mess and education needs to get us out of this mess. And as someone who trained as a teacher years and years ago, I was shocked when I was training as a teacher to find out that a whole bunch of the ways education systems that were set up to educate people who otherwise didn't have access. And I'm talking like 300, 200, 300 years ago. Um, I'm not going to ask people to identify, but how many people in your classes went to Montessori schools? Well, Montessori schools tend to be now private schools that only people with relative privilege can go to unless you get a subsidized spot. I didn't know till I was training to be a teacher that Montessori, um, the, the woman who invented it, invented it because she wanted the poor kids on the streets of Paris to be able to get an education. So it was a, a type of education system that was meant for the people who had the least, not the people who had the most. Why do I use that example? Because um, if we invested in education in the way that we uh, we spend on other things, and you know, I mentioned already the things that I've worked on um, tend to be those who are at the other end and ending up uh, in the legal system and the, the prison systems before I came to the Senate. Part of the reason I came to the Senate is I wanted to be able to work on the very issues that would help prevent more of the people ending up in those systems. Um, than just by trying to pu keep pulling people out of them. And one of the ways is to create a more, yeah, a more equal playing field as we've already talked about. And one of those is one of the things I think we should have is not just equal access to education, early childhood, 
uh, child care, all of those. I absolutely agree with that. I've already said about economic equality and housing and all of that. But I also think we need to provide um, subsidized access to post-secondary education. The parts of the world where that has been true, um, some of the Scandinavian countries, years ago in places like Australia and others, you had free post-secondary education. And guess what? You end up with a happier country, a more economically prosperous country, a more caring country. You have lower crime rates, lower victimization rates, lower incarceration rates. Why wouldn't we want that? Right now, um, women are the Indigenous women are the fastest growing prison population in this country, not because that supposes the greatest risk, but because it's the group that has the least access to equitable services and uh, supports. And you know, in in uh, Cinder Klein's province, ninety eight percent, and in Cinder um, Duncan's territory, ninety five to one hundred percent of the young people who end up in uh, young girls and young women who end up in custody are Indigenous. That's not the percentage of young women in the community. And so the fact that we're willing to pay for kids to be put in the child welfare system, kids to be put in jails, and not willing to invest earlier so that we prevent all of that is, is something we have to continue to work on. And while it's often, as uh, Senator Klein and Senator Duncan have already talked about, something that's a provincial or territorial jurisdiction, when it comes to Indigenous people, we have a particular responsibility uh, to ensure those supports are available for Indigenous people, but we also have an ability to develop national guidelines and uh, that insist that there, uh, there be clear uh, ways to implement that, that, that don't violate our Charter of Rights and Freedoms in that they are equally accessible, whether you're in the Yukon, whether you're in um, Saskatchewan, whether you're in Ontario, or whether you're in PEI. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Senator Duncan, did you have any last thoughts to add to this issue? Okay, wonderful. Um, I do know our class at Muriel Martin does have to hop off the call in two minutes here. Um, did our partners at Cengage want to quickly take their picture before we do our last couple of questions here, just so that we don't lose any of our students? Uh, yes, of course, I can do that. Okay, so we'll just take a quick little break to do a quick picture of all of the participants joining us. So if I could get the classes to face their cameras, we can get a quick picture for our senators here. That would be wonderful before we lose our partners at Muriel Martin. Thank Perfect. you. So I will count to three and take a screenshot of everyone. So one, two, three. Great, thank you so much. Yes, no worries. Okay, um, we are just moving into kind of the last section. Thank you, Muriel Martin, for joining us. Sorry that you have to hop off a bit early, but we appreciate your questions. Um, before I just ask for our last couple thoughts, I do have time for one more question. So do I have any schools that have one last question before we pass it off um, for final thoughts from our senators? I think, Isabel Salon, I think you guys are raising your hands. Okay, yes, go ahead. Sorry about that. Uh, once again, from Isabel Selling School in Southeastern Alberta, this is Nellie Cockrell. She's one of our grade five students. We know that some Indigenous communities have been provided with clean drinking water. How many Indigenous communities in Canada do not have clean drinking water yet? When will clean drinking water be available in all Indigenous communities? Wonderful question. Thank you very much for sharing. So we do have a few minutes. Um, do we have any senators I would like to speak on the issue of clean drinking water? If, if one of my colleagues knows the exact answers to both of those, I, I'll, I'll yield to them. It seems to be a moving target. Uh, there will have been some timeline sets, milestones, I should say, that to achieve that. Um, there are still a significant amount of communities that do not have the drinking water. 
that doesn't mean that uh, that uh, goal has been abandoned. It just seems that there has been some some trials and tribulations, I suppose, in in getting there. But I will say that uh, while there are many, one is too many, and so there's a there's a long road to hold there yet in terms of getting all of those uh, boil water advisories and making sure that every uh, nation has and community has access to potable drinking water and we got a good way to go there but it it's not abandoned it's still a work in progress and uh we i'm sure before this uh before we break for the uh christmas break we'll have probably have asked this of the government a couple more times <laughs> it's a good question i'll turn that over to my colleagues huh? it's if I might, it's a very good question, and it's asked frequently at um, <laughs> at national finance. And my thought is that we should get the answer um, in writing, the the responses we've received, and send them out via send gauge if we could. Yeah, I agree, and um, I just want to say, you know, I'm quoting Cindy Blackstock at a meeting I was at with her uh, about ten months ago now. And she made the comment, and I can't say it better than her, if we can get clean water and internet on the space station, why can't we get it in every community? Very powerful. Um, thank you very much for that question. Um, we appreciate you guys taking the time to prepare those questions for our senators. Now we only have about 10 minutes left, so I would just like to uh, take the chance to ask, um, are there any um, last minute remarks or any takeaways that our senators would like to um, share with our students before we let them get back to their classes for the day. I'm going to be very brief with something, uh, so I leave some time for my colleagues, but uh, Senator Pate was hitting on one thing, and I know it's uh, also with uh, Senator Duncan, but education. Education, education, education provides options for you to continue on your journey in this life. If you do not have an education, you're gonna to come to a, a crossroad, which is kind of gonna be a dilemma. And I, I, I hopefully, if you take the wrong path, you do come back eventually as you become a mature adult and continue your education. I can tell you, I would not be where I am today without education. It just gives you so many options. And it is a way out for a lot of uh, young indigenous people. Thank you. Wonderful. Senator Duncan or Pate, any last thoughts or ideas for our students? Um, sorry, I was waiting. <laughs> to her. Uh, one of the things that I think I'm, and I'm really struck by every time we have the opportunity to meet with young people, I agree with Senator Klein, I'm the first in my family to get a university education. Um, and I have three younger sisters and my daughter is the second. And, and so, and she has uh, cousins who weren't able to go to university for all kinds of reasons. And, uh, but I do, I, I think the, the leadership that young people are demonstrating now and will continue is really, really important to, to people like us and is in particular to me to watch as you tell us and instruct us how to move forward. I am always inspired by groups of young people like yourselves. And it's part of why so many of us try to keep uh, focus on the issues that young people are raising and why, you know, personally, I've tried to make sure that we have interns and people working in our office who uh, keep energizing. So they're the ones who make sure we get on, for at least for me, get on social media, do podcasts, do the things that get me way out of my comfort zone, but are the ways to engage with young people. So I want to thank you all for participating today. I thank my colleagues, thanks Engage and your teachers for making this opportunity and encourage you to just keep spreading the information, but also holding us to account. We are public servants. We work for you. And so um, letting us know if there are things that we're not doing okay, uh, letting us know if there are things you want to know more about that uh, we can try and access. And remembering that all of us are still learning as well every day. I hope until I'm no longer, you know, breathing, um, that 
you know, I'm continuing to learn and, and grow. So thank you very much for this opportunity to, to my colleagues, to Cengage, and especially to those of you from the schools and um, the educators and the students who are also educators in their own right uh, for joining us today. Wonderful, thank you. And Senator Duncan? I'd like to um, also express my sincere thanks to the students and their teachers um, and to Cengage for the opportunity and especially also to my colleagues. They've put this, um, their closing remarks much better than I. Um, the importance of education and lifelong learning. Um, I learn something new every day and I truly um, appreciate the, um, the work of my, my colleagues and the opportunity that um, students to share your perspective and, and to share your views and to teach us. Our children are our greatest teachers. With your questions, why are we doing it this way? How can we do it better? Um, truly appreciate, again, the opportunity. And if I could say one thing, um, I would hope that in the future we can or as we grow and learn together, we can use a whole of Canada approach. We're, we need to recognize, as Senator Pate pointed out, the reality in all throughout this great big country is different. And we need to appreciate and um, understand our differences and grow together. And I look forward to that. And thank you again. I truly, truly appreciate this opportunity. Thank you for letting me share about the Yukon. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, before I say my thank yous, I would just like to remind the students, I hope that you guys got the same feeling that I got from our senators today, that they are the ones that are out there fighting for you. I don't know how many times you noticed that they said that they are getting into fights about these topics and they are bringing up these topics. So um, these topics and these questions that you guys are asking them, they, they are bringing them forward to the government to make real change. So if you haven't done so already and you didn't get a chance to ask your question, there is an activity in the activity guide that we sent uh, to your schools where you actually can mail in questions to the senators. So it's free. You're allowed to send any mail to the Senate for free. Send any of your comments, any of your questions to them. They are listening and they, they do fight for those things that you guys find important. So please keep doing that in the future. You guys had wonderful, amazing questions, and I'm sure our senators would love to hear more from you. So if you haven't done so already, I really suggest that you send those postcards to our senators. Um, the other reminder I'd like to give you guys, this is our uh, preparation for Reconciliation Day. So Reconciliation Day is this Friday. Um, most of us, hopefully all of us, will not be participating in school that day, so you do have the opportunity to participate in your local reconciliation events. Or if you're unable to make it out to an event, there's lots of great online events. So I, I really challenge all of you to please take some time to do something that will actually try to make a bit of a difference in your life and a bit of a change of a perspective. Participate in a reconciliation event. It's a small thing that you can do to try to help edge us forward in the right direction a little bit. So just keep that in mind on Friday. Please wear an orange shirt and support and please actually participate in an event since we will not be learning math that day. You're welcome for that. <laughs> and finally, I would like to say some thank you. So thank you very much to all of our schools, Ecole Father Jeanne, Isabel Salon School, Ecole Mira Martin, Dakota Collegiate, De La Salle College, and Northeast King Center. Thank you very much for your wonderful questions and preparation for this event. We could not do it without amazing students and teachers like you. So thank you very much. I would like to also give a big thank you to Senator Kim Pate, Senator Pat Duncan, and Senator Marty Klein for once again joining us at this event. You guys had a wonderful ideas to share with our students and I hope they found it as inspiring as I did. And thank you, of course, to our partners at Cengage for making this whole session possible. Without you guys, we wouldn't be able to do it. So thank you very much from uh, us over here at CGE. And we hope that this has been inspiring and helped move us in the right direction as we approach September 30th this year. So thank you again very much, everyone. I hope that you have a wonderful day. I hope that we all get to have a good Friday and learn a little something this year at Reconciliation Day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank